Okay, good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, we know that we're going to hear about prayers today. I think uh, I'm quite convicted to teach about that because it is a very critical part of our Christian lives. And according to the Lord Jesus, as you could see, prayer is a very vital necessity in our Christian living. Our Lord Jesus always makes prayer his priority, even though He's been busy in ministry. He always finds time to pray. He wakes up early in the morning, went to a deserted place to pray. And we all know on the night before his crucifixion, he prayed all the more intensively. And the Apostle Paul has never failed to teach about prayer. And you know, in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, Apostle Paul actually talks about the spiritual warfare that is not against the flesh and blood. It's not against the physical army. And the apostle went at length about how to fight this spiritual enemy. And he talks about the full armor of God, as you know. And in one word, uh, the full armor simply meant to equip ourselves with the whole truths of God. But the Apostle Paul didn't end there. He ended with that instruction. In fact, that critical instruction, he says, pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayer on all occasions. Which means to say, the spiritual battle that we Christians are fighting, day and night, will not be won without that critical element of prayer. Now, I think without doubt, we all know the importance of prayer. But in reality, I think it is the hardest thing to do in our Christian life. And the very reason why it's hard to do so, I could only think of one reason, if I want to think just one, because it's simply so hard for us to draw near to God in prayer. Is that so? I don't know about you. A lot of times our hearts... Tell me, you know, in my early Christian life, when I'm praying, my heart just tells me that I'm just doing it ritually. And sometimes when my heart is not helped, not edified, and even after prayer, we know that I'm just doing a duty. I'm just doing a task. And especially when your hearts remain dull and unchanged after prayer. And personally, I've known a lot of Christians coming to me and telling me that they're always plagued with accusations in their hearts. that are guilt and frustrations and low self-esteem, discouragements, you know, affecting their hearts constantly. So you think about it, how could we draw close to God in such a state? And say if after prayer, or even after attending a meeting, the state of our hearts doesn't change. It always brings about more accusation. And to a lot of people, it only meant that we are not a good Christian after all because we are not drawing close to God, our hearts not edified. You see, the thing is, we cannot lie to our hearts. If our hearts are not drawn close to God in prayer, we will not like prayer, right? And when we don't like prayer, we will not be drawn to pray. We would rather read some Christian articles. Uh, we will probably love to sing in the choir or be involved in some Christian ministries rather than to pray, especially if we couldn't get the edification of a heart through prayer. And I know young people being very truthful and upright, <laughs> and I always hear them tell me, why do this when it's only a duty? And sometimes when I ask my kids to pray, I could see they're just going through motion, <laughs> you know. And I don't know how long can that be, you know. When they grow up, they know. Actually, you don't have to grow up. I mean, we human beings, we have to know we are given a personality, right? And God has given us a personality. And for someone with a personality, we need to connect. So when you talk to a person, you need to connect with him in your thoughts and emotions. So it's the same thing with God. When you talk about prayer, you always wonder, 
did I connect with God in my thoughts and emotion? You need to connect with Him. Yet the thing that always makes us pretty helpless is that we cannot change the state of our hearts. When we don't like something, we cannot will our hearts to like it. We cannot will our hearts to yearn for, for something when we don't. So, we need the heart in prayer. That's why this sermon is a lot about prayer and the heart. We know we need the heart. And we know jolly well the Lord Jesus said, the kingdom of God doesn't come upon any other place than your heart. Am I right? The kingdom of God doesn't come upon your room when you pray. It doesn't come upon a space. It doesn't come upon you. When, uh, it doesn't come upon a position when you kneel to pray. <laughs> Am I right? It comes upon the heart. And what kind of heart is that? It is a heart that loves God, that seeks God, and rejoices in His truth. And we know that. So, the heart, we all know, doesn't come at will. Why? Because our heart is played by the sinful nature. And we need a heart, yet our heart are often struck with all kinds of guilt, frustration, coldness, numbness, and those are the things that stop us from praying. But let me ask you a question now. Just as we felt very helpless about our hearts, let me ask you, do you think God knows the state that we are often in? Do you think so? Now give me a nod if you think so. Do you think God knows? Yes. Uh, yeah. When God instructs us to pray and draw close to Him, do you think God knows the problem of our heart? No, I think absolutely yes. The Bible knows exactly the kind of irony Christian face with every day with their hearts. And the Bible has given us very, very clear answers to resolve that kind of irony, that kind of dilemma. So for the answer that God has given us, I have actually summed it up in the title today. Now, what is the title today? Don't trust the heart, yet you need the heart. Now, I know this sounds a bit more irony, no? <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't trust the heart, but you need the heart. Now, by saying that, you know, it seems to mean that the heart is a very peculiar thing, you know? And uh, it's like telling people, you need a bridge to cross the river, but don't trust the bridge, you know? Or you need the surgeon to, to cut away the cancer tumor, but don't trust the surgeon. <laughs> you know, what is it supposed to mean? You know, it's peculiar, right? It's irony, isn't it? But first and foremost, let me say, I think that is what makes the gospel such a beautiful thing. The gospel is not only salvation to sinners. It also provides sinful and ugly hearts with the way to the righteous and holy God. But it's not a direct way, people. It's a way where you cannot just trust the intuition of your heart. You know, we just like to trust what our heart feels. We like to trust our intuition. No, you cannot do that. It's not a direct way to God. But you need to look to Christ again and again. Be reduced to brokenness and contriteness again and again. And then you will see the face of the Lord clearer and clearer. So my young brethren, if you hope to draw close to God, don't expect the easy way out. It's not a quick, hearty feeling which most people are looking out for. Because our God is not a Santa Claus. Our God is not a genie where you can command out of the border by just reciting the name of Jesus Christ. No, our God cannot be found by the sinful heart, but He is near to the broken heart. He saves the contrite in spirit. Psalm 34, right? So I'm going to read to you now. What do I mean by don't trust the heart, but you need the heart in prayer? Jeremiah 
17. No, let's go to the scripture. Jeremiah 17. No, I think I got the scripture wrong. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It's not this one. Okay, no, I'm going to read to you. Okay, if you have me, anyone? Jeremiah, if you turn to your hand phones. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Okay. No, that's Genesis. Not this one either. Okay, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. If you are with me, can we read together? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, I'm going to read to you again. Turn to your, to your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Now, I always quoted this verse when I talk about the heart. And God says, the heart is deceitful above all all things, and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And let's turn to Mark. Mark 7, verse 20. Do you have Mark? Mark chapter 7, verse 20. Chapter 7, verse 20. Our Lord Jesus went on to say, What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of man's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Right? Now, before we really learn about going deep, into prayers with God, we must know that the gospel deals with the heart. And so the way the gospel deals with the heart is to reveal the nature of the heart first. Now, when I say nature, the nature of the heart, I don't mean tendency. A lot of people mix up nature and tendency. Now, when we talk about tendency, it's like we tend to think bad. We tend to think negatively. We tend to be selfish. Now, that's tendency. But the reason for that tendency is because the nature is bad. You get what I mean? The nature is the roots. So, when I say the nature is bad, when the Bible says the nature of the heart is bad, how bad it is? The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all else. The key word is deceitful. It has the capacity to produce all kinds of lies. And the Bible says lies, it doesn't mean trivial lies that kids tell each other. You know, it's not a kind of trivial lies. When the Bible says lies, it is lies against the truth of God. It is lies about God and about what he said. That's why just now you read the book of Jeremiah. What did the prophet Jeremiah say? The prophet Jeremiah said, You prophets prophesy lies. And my people love those lies. And you said peace when there is no peace. And you steal and murder and you bow down to Baal. And you can just go to the temple of the Lord without flinching and do all your sacrifices and all. So what I'm trying to tell you now is, Brandon, what is the greatest lie of all? Now, the greatest lie of all is that humans create their own truths. You get know what I mean? Human create their own truth. And people in the church has created their own brand of Christianity called the prosperity gospel, the grace gospel, the new apostolic gospel, or whichever, the Singapore gospel, or what you call it. Okay? It is a gospel, not of the Bible, but those are the gospel that suits your culture, your convenience, your desires. And by believing God this way, 
People, sta- people feel very peaceful about it. They feel at rest to worship God. They don't need to change. So what I'm telling you, my brethren, is there is a generation of people who believe in the wrong gospel, and these people, they are praying, yet not praying. You get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Now, if you believe the wrong gospel, you could be praying fervently, daily, piously, but your prayer doesn't reach the ears of God because you have prayed on the basis of lies. God is not what you made him out to be, yet you are calling upon a God, not what the Bible says, but that you have created. So you have a generation of people who are praying and not praying. Their prayers hasn't reached the ears of God. Now you have to understand that. That's why the decline of Christianity in a Western nation, and probably, I don't know, in the Singapore churches, I don't know, but we are called by God to know, first of all, what is the gospel fundamentally. So before you go into deep prayers with God, you got to know the gospel at heart first. Okay? But before we talk about prayers, I say it again, you got to know the gospel at heart first. What is the gospel at heart? The gospel simply tells you about three things. Okay, I'm going to mention here, okay? Three things. Number one, when you learn about the gospel, number one, the gospel tells you about your sin. Our sin against God. Against God. Okay, it's not the sins that you committed like every other person. It's a sin. It's an original sin. It's a fundamental sin. It's a root sin that we have all committed against God. That's number one. And then number two, the gospel went on to tell us that God saves us from our sins through faith in Jesus alone. Okay, that's number two. Okay, so number one, sin. And number two, the salvation of God. Now, you know all this, right? And then number three, and after putting your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus alone, the gospel, number three, sets you apart from the world and sets you in a pursuit of God and His kingdom. Okay, you get what I mean? God and His kingdom. So the truth of God is given to all of us to tell us everything about what is sin, different from what the world knows. The truth of God is given us to tell us about salvation in Jesus alone. And the truth of God is given us to tell us, how do you live for God and seek you first the kingdom of God? Now, that's basically what the whole gospel is all about. And mind you people, the Holy Spirit is given you to teach you everything about this. That's why when Lord Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have said. And He will guide you into all truths. Now, the Holy Spirit has to come because you have a spiritual enemy. And that spiritual enemy comes with his lies. And because of those lies, you will always forget the fundamentals of the gospel. You will always forget things of the sin. You will always forget about putting your faith in Jesus alone. You will always forget about living for the kingdom of God. Very soon after you do your conversion prayer, after your baptism, very soon you will be living in the lies of the world. You will be deceived. You will be played with the worries of life. Now, very soon, that's why the Holy Spirit is given us to remind us again and again so that with the gospel truths, 
you could draw near to God. You get what I'm saying? So, my brethren, okay? Now, if you want to experience closeness to God, now first of all, you have to ask yourself, how do you draw close to God in your heart when your heart doesn't have the truth? You get what I'm saying? The fallen heart rejects the truth. The fallen heart leans towards untruths. That's why you have a whole generation of people praying and not praying and just doing prayer ritually. That's why before I even talk about prayer, I have to deal with the heart. And how do you deal with the heart? And the Bible says you have to have a renewal of your heart. Renewal. You get what I mean? And God has to remove that heart of stone to give you a heart of flesh. You get what I mean? So my brethren, has that happened to you? Has that happened to you? The question is, if that has happened to you, my dear brethren, you will yearn for the truth. You will not seek a truth which only suits your taste. And sometimes you felt, Pastor, no, I couldn't lift out the truth. I felt so condemned, so oppressed, so helpless. I couldn't lift out the truth. But because of this renewal of your heart, you know you have to seek out more truths. You got to know more truths so that you could be empowered by the spirit of truth. You could be guided and taught and comfort and convict by the spirit of truth. You get what I mean? So it all starts from the renewal of the heart. You get what I'm trying to say? Now, but I know your problem now is everyone here might want to assume that I'm already in Christ, you know, um, all right? I've been a Christian for quite some time. My heart, though it's weak, it has been renewed and transformed. But you know we are all still prone to spiritual attacks, right? We are all still prone to spiritual attacks. Even if you've been a Christian for 20 years, 30 years like me, our hearts are still prone to the enemy's lies. Our hearts are prone to be tempted. Our hearts are prone to be accused by the evil ones. And sometimes, our hearts are prone to feel abandoned by God when it is painful, when it is in anguish, or when it is caught in sin. Am I right? We feel aban abandoned by God during those, those moments. And that's why we always hear Christians say, I can't pray. I, I can't feel close to God, you know. To, to be absorbed in the world seems so easy, but to obey God seems so burdensome. So come to a point you know the truth is only in your head, but it's not internalized into your heart. It doesn't speak to you, right? So when that happens, how do you read that? When that happens, you must know you are engaged in a spiritual warfare. And when you are in a spiritual warfare, the number one rule is don't believe everything your heart tells you. You get what I'm saying? Okay, I'm going to say it again, okay? You get what I'm saying? When you are engaged in a spiritual warfare, okay, when you are feeling accused, feeling abandoned, you know, uh, you, you couldn't come out of certain scenes in your life. Now, when those things happen to you, now you must know that you are in a spiritual warfare. And when you are in a spiritual warfare, the number one rule is don't believe everything that your heart tells you. 
Because at that moment, your heart is under the attack of the evil one. It is being given insinuations of lies and accusations by the evil one. Now, it's like when, when someone is in a battlefield. Now, me guys, if you have been in the army, you know. Now, when you are in a battlefield and you know that your enemy has intruded into your radio signal, right? They have intruded into that radio signal and they are confusing the signal they are receiving. It is transmitting the wrong information to you. So, both your headquarters as well as the enemy are giving you information. So, it is difficult to believe everything that your radio signal is transmitting to you. You get what I mean? But you still need that signal. You still need that intelligence. You get what I'm trying to say? Or it is like the internet. You know there are fake news in the internet. You cannot trust every news that you read in the internet. But you still need the internet, in a way. Because you need information and all. So it's the same thing now, when you are in a spiritual warfare, you cannot trust your heart, but you need the heart. You get the idea? So at that juncture, listen carefully, okay? At that juncture, if you believe the wrong voice in your heart, you will lose the heart to pray. So if there are worries of life, if there are accusations, if there are misdirected truths plaguing your heart, and you take it in, you will lose the heart to pray. And that's why the Apostle Paul took great pains to tell us in Romans chapter 8, who can bring any charge against you, Christian? Who is he that condemns? Who is it that deprives you? If God can give you his only son, how would he not give you all things? And nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You see, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 went to great lengths to tell us now the truth. But you see, the Bible, we thank God that also the Bible took great pains to instruct us how to draw near to God during those spiritual attacks. And that's what my message is driving at now, okay? So let's go to James chapter 4. Can you do something about anything about the volume here or, or anything? Is there a hollow voice or something went wrong? Okay. Now, let's go to James chapter 4. Now, I'm going to tell you how the Bible took great pains to instruct us how to draw near to God. James, book of James chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 7. Now, I'm going to read verse 7. What it says here, verse 7, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grief, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Let's read together. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Now, can we just read again uh, verse 7? Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, what's stopping us from drawing close to God? Verse 8 says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. But before that, the Bible talks about the devil. The devil. Resist the devil. He is the one stopping you from coming close to God. But how are you going to resist the devil? Because you are, the devil is too strong for you. No one can resist the devil by your will. So you've got to go to the truth of God. And know how to resist the devil by the way God says. 
So if you're going to look to James chapter 1, no, cha no chapter 4, verse 1, over here, it tells us that the devil, what, the devil is coming against us with a few things. You look at chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that sinful desires, that better within you? How is that desire like? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And later on, if you are with me, okay, if you have your Bible, okay, I prefer if you, if you open your Bible and read. Verse 6, but he gave us more grace. And that is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now, listen carefully what I'm going to say here. It's something spiritual. Basically, over here, the Bible has tell us that there are three things that the devil will come against you with. And the devil is doing everything to stop us from drawing close to God. And what is that three things that he often used? Number one, it is the sinful desires that better within you, which we commonly know as flesh. It is a self-centered nature that doesn't please God. It's a desire that doesn't seek God's will and only want things for yourself. That's why you kill and covet. You fight and quarrel, you see? That desire, number one, okay? So your desires are stopping you now. You realize? If you have very strong intent to want something just for yourself or to achieve anything just for yourself, you realize you cannot draw close to God. You know, this is the desire that every sinful creature has. Number two, what is that thing that stop us from drawing close to God. What is the devil using? The devil always used the world. The world, which the prince of the world will use at his disposal to entice your heart. That's why the Bible says, don't you know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So, what did I say about the world? Remember just a few weeks ago when I preached, do you remember? The world, do not conform to the world. The form, form meaning is an existing structure and system. Remember I said that? The existing thing. So the thing is, when you, when you want to conform to an existing structure, I want to be popular. That's what everyone wants. I want to look good among my peers. I don't want to be left behind. I want to be pursuing what everyone is pursuing. I don't want to be left out conforming to this system, conforming to this structure that the world is offering. Everyone gets a degree at this age. Everyone gets married at this age. Everyone gets something at this age. So I also want it. So the world, when it entices you, your heart, when it entices your heart with these things, listen carefully, that's where you find yourself not being able to draw close to God. Okay, and uh, because friendship with the world is enemy with God. Okay, and number three, number three, what is it? Number three, it is which the devil always come against us with is is a spirit of haughtiness, a spirit of proudness. Believe in yourselves. Believe that you are right. Believe. So for such a person, he refused correction by the truth of God. He refused to be humbled by God. And that's why God says, God opposed the proud and gave grace to the humble. Am I right to say that? So what is that three things now? Desires, the world, 
haughtiness, or proudness. But strangely, okay, over here, listen carefully. Very strangely, if you are with me at James chapter 4, the Bible says something here very amazingly. But God shows us more grace. Now, try to get this. Okay, that's the turning point of this verse. But God shows us more grace. Who does he give his grace to, my brethren? God gives grace to who? To the humble. That is to the person who realizes his proudness. The person who realizes his sins, his desire. The person who realizes his love for the world and he repents in humility. So, thank God for that. I don't know for you, but throughout my Christian life, if there is one thing I truly learn of, it is the relentless grace of God. Because I myself know how evil my heart is, how self-centered my heart is. And if God is going to treat me according to the sin that I deserve, now it will be unimaginable. But the Lord is always gracious and merciful. And he allows sinners to draw near to him. As he said, come near to God and he will come near to you. Now, one of the questions that I'm often asked by Christians is this. Someone will ask me, Pastor, if I know that I'm living in sin, so do I first live my life of sin before I could draw near to God? Or do I draw near to God first? Then I could find strength to resist those sins. Now, what do you think? Now, there's two schools of thoughts here. Now, one school of thought is, now, the Lord is holy and righteous. Get your act right first. Before you can approach the holy God. <laughs> now, that's one school of thought. And that I'm often heard, you know, when I was young, you know. Or there's another school of thought that says, okay, come near to God first. Then you will find strength to overcome your sins. Now, which one? Do you want to choose? Which one would you want to believe? <laughs> now, you have to get this right first, okay? You got to get this right. Now, not only for some theological curiosity, no, for yourself. Because with this sinful heart, we are always in this state of whether it is getting our act right first or going to God first. Now I'm going to give you the answer, okay? According to biblical teaching, according to what the Bible has revealed, by the grace of our Lord Jesus, God has made it possible for sinners to come to Him even when they are still in the act of that sin. Do you amen to that? Do you amen to that? Even if you are still grievous, you are still hateful to your, towards your brethren, even my young people, you are rebellious to your, towards your parents and you still are, or even if you are involved in some kind of sexual sins currently, let me say that God in His grace has made it possible for you to come to him right in that state. Amen? So that's why John, 1 John chapter 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So my brethren, no one is turned away from the face of God because of his sin. That's the assurance that God has given us because of what the Son done on the cross. God has not put any hurdle between him and the sinner. Amen? Yet, listen, yet, it is important to note that the Bible also tells us 
that there is an accuser who accuses us day and night because of our sins, right? So even the slightest sin will invite his accusation. So that accusation will not turn God away from us, but it will turn us away from God. You get what I'm saying? Let me say again. There is an adversary who accuses us day and night. Satan. His name is the accuser. Now, that accusation, he knows your act. He knows what you've been engaging in and still engage in. So the thing is, he will accuse us before God. God will not turn away from us. But because of his accusation, we will feel the shame and the condemnation and therefore we will not want to pray. We will don't feel like praying. We will somehow turn away from God. You get what I mean? So the thing is, listen carefully, the thing is, if you are conscious of your sins, you know you are not right before God. You should not give any excuse that says, Oh God, you don't listen to prayer because I'm a sinner. No, so you don't listen to prayer. Not, not those things. God says, Come to me, you sinner. You get what I mean? Come. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Because God has given us His promise. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, in your sin, come to God not just to get any comfort or blessings of whatever sort. Come to Him to get right with God. You understand what I'm saying? The purpose, the aim, the chief end is to get right with God. The chief end is not, God, you know I'm sinning, you know, but please comfort me, let me feel good, let me feel love, you know, you get what I mean? It's not that. You get what I'm trying to say? Come to get right with God. God didn't put any hurdle between you and Him, despite your sins. So that brings us to what is true confession? Because God says, if you confess our sins, He's faithful and just. What is the act of true confession? So, if you're going to go to James again, okay, James chapter, chapter 4, verse 8, what did God say? Listen carefully. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. And notice what it says after this. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, the true act of confession lies in this phrase. And I split it into two parts. Number one, wash your hands, you sinners. Number two, purify your heart, you double-minded. Now, listen carefully. Let's understand. What does the Bible mean by wash your hands, you sinners? Now, what is hands? What do you do with your hands? You do the act of sin with your hands. You get what I mean? So hand simply means living the act itself. We are doing it. We are living it. So wash your hands, you sinners, means live your life of sin. Live it today. Live your pornography. Live your rebellious act. Live your nightlife. Live whatever sins you are engaging in. Live it now. If you know it doesn't please the Lord, live it today. Even if you may fall into it tomorrow. But today, as you hear the word of God, live it today. Live it now. You get what I mean? In obedience to God. You understand? Okay? Wash your hands, you sinners. Right in this message, you know the way you are living and what you are doing is sin before God. Right at this juncture, live it. God, I'll live it. Even if I fall the next moment, Lord, I'm going to trust your grace and seek your mercy now by wanting to live. 
That's sin. Amen? Now, that's getting right with God. That's true confession. Next thing, okay? Number two, purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does that mean? Now, the thing about the heart is, as I've said, it is something that cannot be controlled. And we know most of the sins, in fact, all sins come from the heart. For instance, a grievous heart, a bitter heart, a prideful heart, a lustful heart, a covetous heart. It's all about this heart, you know? You can't stop yourself from thinking of what is hateful, what is lustful, what is angry. I can't stop my heart from dwelling in those things. But do you know that the fundamental of your heart is not that? It's not that state that I've mentioned that you're in. The fundamental of your heart, the fundamental problem of your heart is double mindedness. That's why the scripture says, purify your hearts, you double minded. What is double minded? Now listen carefully. Double minded meaning, as simple as it sounds, meaning you have two minds, or as if you have two souls. So you pre- with one mind, you pretend to be something, but with another mind, you actually meant otherwise. What do you call this? What do you call this? A hypocrite. <laughs> do you get what I mean? A hypocrite. You pretended to love the Lord, but actually, with another mind, you love the world. <laughs> You pretend that with one mind to be listening to the word of God, but with another mind, actually you intend to live the way you want. You give your tithes. Yeah, I'm a tithe giver here. But with another mind, and you say, I'm going to trust, I'm not going to trust God with the rest of my money, okay? The rest of the money is mine. <laughs> you get what I mean? All right? Do you realize? The intent of that heart meant hypocrisy. And I don't always have parents coming to me and say, Pastor, please pray for my child. You know, Well, you are asking the Lord to help your child. The thing is, God has listened to, the, to that. And God will want to help your child. But somehow, if you harbor the intention, God, please help my child the way I want him to be. That's double-mindedness. Don't you realize that? That's hypocrisy. Having two minds, as if in two souls. And by doing that, you know that you are not struggling with sins. You are not struggling with the love of the world. Which if you are, you will find mercy from the God. Am I right? So, my brethren, what is true confession? And over here, God is extending two calls to us. Number one, He is calling sinners to live their life of sin. And second, He's calling hypocrites to come to God with one mind, with one heart. You get what I mean? That is what it meant by Purify your hearts. So the thing is, if you are feeling very numb, very distant from God, not having the heart to pray, don't worry about that feeling. You deal with what is concretely important. That is the sin that you are living in now. And second, your double-mindedness, your hypocrisy. Once you got that right, your hearts will be liberated you will find yourself naturally drawing close to God. Amen to that? Now, the Bible went on to talk about this because it's not an easy thing, okay? Now, if you have your Bible, now James chapter 4, the Bible went on to say, uh, now, um, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What is the next verse? Now, I'm going to just finish with this because I, I think... This is such an important verse about the heart that you need to know uh, before you can go into deep prayers with God. In the verse 9, it says, Grieve, mourn, and wail. 
Grief, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, in the past, I used to have a problem with this verse. I mean, why does the Lord want us to grieve? Didn't God want us to be happy Christians? <laughs> and uh, didn't the Apostle Paul told us to rejoice? But why the grieving here? Simply because it is such a pain to struggle with sin. It is such an anguish to struggle with the love of the world, my brethren. Don't you think it is so painful and helpless when you couldn't draw near to God? Don't you think it's such a struggle when your heart is numb, when you know your prayers doesn't reach the ears of God, and living in accusations, and then as a result, merely finding temporal satisfaction from the world? Now, a genuine Christian cannot live this way. So, in a genuine Christian living, somehow you have to get into this kind of grieving and mourning, which I call godly grieving and mourning. Godly grieving and mourning. Now, it's not the kind of mourning when you fail your exams or you didn't make the cut for your promotion. It's not that kind of grieving. This kind of grieving is such that you are grieving because you couldn't draw near to God because of your sin. You're grieving because your pursuit of God is stagnant. There is so much obstacles in reaching God. And you know the problem is with your heart. And grief because of that. Grief. And if you grieve because of that, you will not get depression. If you're just grieving because you don't get what you want in this world, you will get depression. You get what I mean? Grieve. If you grieve this way, if you have a godly grieving and mourning, you will in fact receive healing. Now, there's a point in my pastoral life where I felt so tired, so exhausted, and sometimes so wounded by people that I have been helping and sometimes overwhelmed by family commitments and all. And you see, when you put all these things together, these discouragements stop me from coming close to God. I could be serving, but I know my heart wasn't close to God because with all the problems put together, it's overwhelming. Now, but when I read this verse, I remember very clearly when I read this verse, I begin to realize when a person cannot come close to God, he will tend to attribute it to every other external reasons. Now, some people, some sisters will say, Yeah, Pastor, you know, I'm a woman, you know, woman weak will, how to be strong. Then some brothers will say, No, you know, I'm the sole breadwinner, so pressurizing, how to pray. You know, what has that got to do with prayer? You know what I mean? But people will, will attribute their inability to get close to God to some external reasons or external problems they are facing in their lives. And they wallow in self-pity. Now, I realize after reading this verse that apart from these external reasons, God has in fact given us a way in Him. That is, if I am only concerned about one thing, that is my relationship with God, my closeness with God, and I am grieving, mourning, not for my livelihood, for my career, or for my children, but because God, I'm not hearing from you. I'm not close to you, that's why I'm grieving. And if you grieve this way, God will in fact clear all the obstacles for you to come close to Him. Amen to that? Now, that is what I want you to experience in prayer. Now, we have attribute our inability to come to God to every other reason. But why didn't you grieve? Because you haven't been able to come close to God. And if you do that, God will open up the way for you to come close to Him and every difficult situation will turn around at the end. 
So I began to have an absolute belief in me is that if I get right with God, everything else will be set it. Will be set it. Amen? So, okay, so I'm coming to the last one. Okay, the last verse, can we just read together if we are in the Bible? Verse 10. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. Now, this is probably the best conclusion. Now, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. Now, if you read chapter 4 of the book of James, basically, chapter 4 talks about pride. You see, our desires, chapter 1, our desires are prideful. We want what we want. We kill and covet. We fight and quarrel because we want what we want. Now, this is called pride. And then number two, why do you start a friendship with the world? You start a friendship with the world because why? You want to be lifted high up, not in the sight of God, but in the sight of the world. Am I right? You want to be lifted high in the sight of the world. We want to be popular among our friends. We want to be seen as doing well among our peers, isn't it? And the devil, through your desires, through the world, will reduce us to nothing. But if you humble yourself before the Lord, you will be drawn to the Lord and you will see the goodness of the Lord once more. Now, there was a brother, I'm going to end with this, okay? There was a brother whom I know many years ago. He migrated to Australia for a better life. And what he was seeking was for a good, comfortable life, a life that is well provided for, a life that is protected by the social security in Australia and all. So he told his friends and peers that he was going for a better life. And to the envious of his friends. And so he went. But the unthinkable happened. What happened? He lost his wife. He lost his job. And he was just reduced to nothing. And he was given up his job in Singapore. There was a good job. He couldn't come back anymore. And he told me he lost everything. And he's just driving Uber to make ends meet over there. And I told him, I said, come back to Singapore. Start all over again. Start with God. Start with God first. And I remember very clearly what he said to me. I said, he said, Pastor, I know what you mean. But it's hard to face my peers because I went away with everything. And now I have nothing. And it's such a shame to, to see my friends even in the streets. And sometimes when I come back to Singapore, I, I couldn't. I, I hate to be seeing my friends you know, in the street. I don't want to face them. I don't know what to say at all. No, I could understand his pain and shame. And I think if it's me, I would have felt the same way too. But when he told me that, I remember very clearly, this verse came to my mind. And I told him, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now my brethren, if you are in a very sorry state, if you have been dealt a bad hand, you don't have to prove anything, not to yourself, not to anyone around you. All you need to do is to humble yourself before the Lord and let Him lift you up. Let Him do the work. Let Him prosper you again. So in conclusion, my brethren, don't let your heart deceive you. Don't let your feelings deceive you. The Lord always welcome us with open arms. And if the Lord is ready to welcome us, He promised to restore us. And if you rid yourself of your sins, of your double-mindedness, grieve, mourn, and wail because of that, humble yourself before the Lord, He will lift you high up, and you will always remain high. Amen?
come. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the words you've given us. And uh, it's such a heartfelt message. And if we are honest about it, this is a message that we could confirm it very clearly in our Christian walk. Not only on ourselves, but among the people that we've known, we've seen. Father, sometimes, in fact, all the time, we saw our lack and limitation. But it is you who give us more grace. And no matter how our situation, you are always extending your grace and mercy to us. So Lord, we want to look to you. And we don't want to wallow in our self-pity or in our inability. We don't want to give reasons or excuses for not being able to draw close to you. For by your blood, you have removed every hostility between yourself and us. So Lord, we come to you. We want to draw near to you. We want to be right before you in our life, in our hearts, and so that we could hear from you. And we know the hardest thing for us to do is to humble ourselves and to yield our will to you. So Lord, I pray for your intervention, your supernatural work upon us, upon our hearts, that with each word and sermon given, let us be able to draw near to you with that word. Let us come to you in submission, in humility, and see ourselves being lifted up by you once again. And Lord, I pray uh, that um, speak to each and every one of us. All of us have different needs. And uh, our young people, our youths, they are in the process of growing up. Our middle-aged people, you know, we have come a long way, but we need to be renewed by you. So Lord, whichever uh, generation we are in, we know uh, that generation needs you. And let us be our witness to that generation that we are in. Let us turn to you, find strength to be your witness wherever we go. Thank you so much. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.